Now, folks, let's return you to the Dar and Ravi trial. They're back in session. Jacob Tam has now left the stand, and now a new witness is on. Her name is Jennifer Frost Hellstrom. She's the assistant director of resident life at Rutgers, and the prosecutor, Julia McClure, McClure is questioning her right now. So they're going to talk that issue over very quickly. That gives us a chance to bring in our experts. Uh, we've got an in-session legal analyst and contributor, Sonny Hostin, with us. We also have U.S. immigration attorney and former federal prosecutor, Michael Wildes. Now, Michael, it's good that you're joining us because you give us a chance to focus on Ravi. And we remember that he was offered a plea deal. He was looking at, uh, at most, five years in jail. He chose to turn that down. But he's not a U.S. citizen. If he's convicted in this particular case, what could happen to him? And for that matter, could anything happen to his family as well? Absolutely. If he is a green card holder, as I've read about, or a student visa holder, no doubt he would not only be punished for any crime, but could be put in removal proceedings. The term of art that immigration lawyers look toward is whether or not he would be convicted or would have pled to a crime involving moral turpitude, something that would shock the conscience. Crimes of violence, crimes of invasion of privacy, credit card fraud, all of these have truly qualified through time. You would, of course, be accepted then under the petty offense doctrine if the crime or the plea had less to do than a year's service in a prison. So a very sophisticated immigration lawyer would not only want to work in tandem with a criminal uh, lawyer to defend the gentleman, but to make sure that he wouldn't be susceptible to removal. Now, the contention here of the defense is he didn't commit a crime whatsoever and therefore should not be removed from the United States. And truthfully, I think that um, this is new cutting edge. This is not only cutting edge in cyber bullying in technology. It underlines so much from the questions asked whether or not parents should really be sending their children who aren't prepared to act responsibly with computers or otherwise. And truthfully, in the end, when it comes to technology-related crimes, we see here, as they're trying to establish on television right now before us, the chain of custody as to what the state of mind of Ravi was, that he was intimidated and expressed that intimidation publicly, uh, how important this is. But the immigration goes to the core of Ravi's defense, and ultimately he may have to face the music on that front regardless. And ultimately that could be the main reason why he didn't accept the plea deal, or, as his lawyer has said in the past, it could be because of almost the principle of the thing. He felt from the... And, and this is... It to be expected from a defense lawyer. He doesn't believe his client is guilty in this case. That's why they're trying this case. Now, Sonny, we're getting into the tweets and things like that as the director of student life is, is going through her testimony. How do you see the progression going? Because I, I feel like I'm starting to see this prosecution focus in on uh, Tyler Clemente's belief, trying to hit that third prong of bias intimidation, how Tyler felt. But they're still trying to involve elements of how Darren Ravi felt. They didn't really pursue Jacob mm -hmm. Tam too much to talk about, and that's his close friend that he was texting and tweeting back and forth with about Darwin Robbie's impressions there. Where do you think they're taking this witness? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think they're trying to really prove the bias intimidation because um, Michael and I, our, our guests, were just talking. It's so nice to have another former federal prosecutor sitting with me. In <laughs> Two studio. federal prosecutors uh, so, in so. one room. <laughs> the power over there. That's unusual, right? <laughs> um, but but what's, it, what was interesting to me is that, you know, the invasion of privacy piece, and this is very cutting edge because I don't think our laws have caught up with social media quite yet, and, and we're, we're trying to get there. So the invasion of privacy piece, in my mind, is kind of a, a home run for the prosecutor. Prosecution. Tyler asked for his privacy. He didn't get it. He ha instead, he had, you know, what was a private encounter, basically streamed to other people. But in terms of the bias intimidation, it's it's a place where prosecutors don't really like to find themselves because you typically don't have to prove motive. You don't have to get into anyone's heads. It's usually the defense attorney that's trying to prove an insanity defense or something like that that has to show what's in someone's head. But if you're trying to prove it bias. You have to show that someone inside was biased. But with the intimidation piece, what's so unusual about this New Jersey statute is that you do have this third prong where you get to sort of show how the receiver of the alleged intimidation felt. Did, did Tyler Clemente feel that he was targeted because of his sexual orientation? Did he feel intimidated? Yeah. And that's exactly what, what I think this prosecution is, is going for. All right, Sonny, Michael, thank you so much. Court's back in session. Let's put our viewers back inside. They asked for a few moments. Gives us a chance to bring back in Sonny and Michael. Um, you know, Sonny, it's interesting the way they're pursuing this 
because now we're going through the tweets, and I think this is the, the, the primary part of their ability to tell the bias, intimidation, and to a lesser extent the invasion of privacy part of Dara and Robbie's case. They're going through those tweets, you know, oh, this is what happened in this room. I, I'm shooting it with my webcam. This, to me, and I want to get your sense of it, is really the essence of what they've got on Ravi, that he's setting up this camera and that he's basically filming it and he's broadcasting to everyone that, hey, I plan on doing this. Come see, take a look, whatever it may be. That's right. In, in order for the government to prove its case, it has to prove that he published it to someone else, right? Michael and I were just discussing that. And, and, and I think that's why they're, they're putting their case forward the way that they are. Again, I think the, invest, uh, the invasion of privacy here is not going to be that difficult to show. I do think that the bias intimidation piece is going to be difficult to, to, to prove. And I wonder, Ryan, if we're going to get into... Uh, in closing arguments, would Ravi have done, had done this if Ty Clementi had been with a girl? You know, what was his motivation for not only setting up the webcam, but publishing it to other people, but tell, you know, and telling other people, hey, if you, if you log on, this is what you will see. So I, I think that's why we're hearing so much about the, the tweeting and, and the social media. What I think is fascinating is that the, the government is really having to teach many of these jurors about social media. And mm -hmm. I think they're actually doing a pretty good job of uh, doing that. They are. They, I think they really are as well. And it's not all that clear for folks who haven't been tweeting and texting and all this kind of stuff. But you make a great point. Would he have done this if Tyler Clemente was with a girl? But Michael, when I look at the defense side of this, one thing they have done with almost every witness is they get every witness to get up and on their cross-examination they say, has Dar and Ravi ever said anything to you that was derogatory towards gays or lesbians? Has Dar and Ravi ever said anything derogatory about Tyler Clemente? Has there been any evidence or any talk to you about the fact that he didn't like his roommate? They keep going over and over again about that. And, and, and my sense there is they're trying to build in, hey, this bias intimidation, is steeped in the fact that he has to have something against Tyler Clemente because of his sexual orientation. And they seem to be trying to point out it's just not there. Absolutely. And I think Sonny's points are very well taken. When you pull the lens back on the landscape here and you ask yourself whether or not this would have happened if it was a heterosexual couple, and ultimately what the government is trying to establish here, the state government, is that it doesn't matter as much sometimes if the gentleman himself had a bias or wanted to intimidate somebody who was a gay American. The question is also, did this gentleman, the victim, actually feel that he was threatened, that he published that to the school? I mean, truthfully, anybody watching this, this is new territory. This technology, these cyber crimes, learning the tweeting, did this stream, did this go out there, was it published to a second party, did he invite people? The difference between Skyping and chatting and tweeting and all of this now going fundamentally to a new generation of jurors. You know, this will scare the hell out of any child with a computer as to whether or not they're actually invading somebody's um, space and the propriety with which we're going to use new technology. So in many ways, there's a deterrence that the government is putting out here as we across America watch this unfold. Federal prosecutors, state prosecutors, legislators the world over are now having to face crimes that we never imagined. And fundamentally, what's at issue here for the defense is this is a tragic thing would happen to the victim, but did this gentleman intend on killing, and is, should he be responsible for what might, what might be the cause of his activity, and did he proximately cause that? In other words, yeah. the different legal standards in a criminal trial are going to come out here, but this unfolds dramatically in new territory as we all watch this. Yeah, you make a great point there. Did he intend? Was he the proximate cause? But that intent on Dar and Ravi's part, and then what did Tyler Clemente perceive for that, for that uh, bias intimidation? Michael Wildes, thank you so much for joining us. Sonny Hostin, stick around, folks. We'll be right back. Again, we're covering North Carolina versus Young, as well as New Jersey versus Ravi. Young is in lunch break, but Dar and Ravi's just taking a very short five to ten minute break. So when we come back, we'll put you back in New Jersey versus Ravi. Keep it right here. The very max that he could see in jail time was five years. But essentially, uh, the prosecution in this case, if I have this right, was saying that he was really looking at community service as part of it. Um, do you think he's pursuing this case? And I know lawyers talk about it's the principle to think he is not guilty. But do you think that part of the reason why they're taking this to trial 
is the deportation issue. He's also got a brother, by the way, who is the family's only U.S. citizen, but he's under 18. I wonder if it affects the little brother or the family. This, this has a, a dramatic effect on the entire family. Whether you're a former Beatle or you're on trial, the U.S. immigration officials are relentless in trying to rid the United States. It's, it's a dichotomy if you look at it because it was only in this generation that homosexuality, a ground of excludability, was removed from the Immigration Act. I teach in a law school and it's fundamental that the immigration authorities will look to rid the United States of criminals who are convicted of crimes or those that plead to crimes, anything involving narcotics, guns, or untoward sexual conduct. And the question here ultimately is just how dispositive, how important is the immigration? Listen, there are hallmark cases where the U.S. Supreme Court and others have come out saying that criminal lawyers that do not consult with an immigration lawyer before they take a plea or advance a case that can place their client in legal harm's way yet with more proceedings, more trials, could be held culpable for malpractice. In this case, I'm shocked that the lawyer, unless he's really a diehard when it comes to uh, the innocence of the crime, didn't accept a plea that would accept his client from being deported or placed into removal proceedings and assuming that the government would be relentless and put him in removal proceedings mm -hmm. uh, then you have to weigh the effect or the kind of potentiality you know you look here at the indictment you're looking at fifteen different counts right of which if they establish if they establish any one of them okay they're all third fourth degrees but if they establish any of them the immigration authorities is going to have the eyes of the world, the cameras watching them to see that they take decisive action. And finally, with regard to your concern about the brother, once you're a U.S. citizen, once you're on U.S. soil, the government cannot remove you. Mm, okay. And the All brother right. is safe. The brother is safe, but he could be placed into removal proceedings, but I believe would be exonerated. He certainly should have taken the deal if I was consulted based on what we see publicly. Okay, okay. And what's going to be interesting to see in all this, I, I don't. I don't think the prosecution was offering to take him out of removal proceedings if he did take the deal. I think that could be part of the reason why he's not taking it in this case. But you make excellent points there. Sonny. And Ryan. Go ahead. Uh, and, and actually, I, I spoke to uh, the defense attorney Altman about that. And my understanding from him is that the prosecution offered to recommend that he not be deported. But Michael will tell oh. you that doesn't mean anything. I yeah. mean, it's a federal proceeding, not a state proceeding. So this is a state prosecution. So the fact that the state is going to say, hey, listen, you know, we don't think, even though he's pled guilty to, I think, a crime of moral turpitude, which is invasion of privacy, right, or, or bias intimidation, don't deport him. ISIS doesn't care about that yeah, recommendation. They run their own calendar the right. independent of uh, the state courts. Yeah. And again, this is the same federal law throughout the United States, and there's mm -hmm. a policy consideration the federal government has uh, separate than Rutgers and the politics of New Jersey mm -hmm. to make sure that this is dealt with summarily and harshly. That is interesting because it's because and, and you you got to in some ways look at the defense and probably think that they saw through that a little bit because the state's saying, hey, we'll give you an assist. That assist maybe not meaning very little, very much. here. Right now, Sonny, there, there's another part of this case that we've been talking about a lot. And folks just want to let you know that counsel and the Ravi trial are in sidebar. So we've got a couple more minutes here. One thing that a lot of people have been saying to me about this case is um, the far-reaching impact of it. We talk about young people. I, I know that I have a relative. Uh, they take pictures of themselves. They post it on the web. And I'm always telling them, don't you realize employers, other people might see these later, years from now, mm -hmm. and, and use those to evaluate you? I, I think this case, and this is what a lot of people have been asking me, will this case have an impact on our children, on our young adults who are so used to tweeting and texting and emailing and all these things, but now maybe seeing not only the ramifications of what can happen to them because of it, but also Tyler's situation. We can't know what made him jump off that bridge, unfortunately, but if this was even a part of that, I wonder if this is waking people up to the impact that their actions, where they think they're small just tweeting about somebody, could really have on someone's life. I think there's no question that this case becomes a cautionary tale for our youth today, right? I, I think there's no question about that. Um, I worked with Anderson Cooper on a special at Rutgers University on bullying, and, and the special was, was very much uh, about the ramifications 
that came from the Tyler Clemente case and, and cyberbullying and, and bullying people because of uh, uh, sexual orientation. And, and I, I myself, you know, have young children, a nine-year-old who now is fascinated uh, by the Internet. And even though we have all those parental controls on our computers at home, I felt after reporting on this case and, and, and commenting on this case that I had to sit him down and say, these are the things that are happening in the world. Look at this case in particular, and this is what you cannot do. And I think it's also one of the reasons why the government brought this case, because as Michael said before, this is sort of a new world for, for prosecutors, right? But, but I mean, social media, it, the law hasn't really caught up. It hasn't, and you, you made a remarkable point before, and that is if this was a heterosexual couple, would they actually uh -huh. have made the effort here to prosecute somebody and mm -hmm. would have it made news? And, mm -hmm. you know, again, we're growing up in a different age where my 12-year-old daughter last mm -hmm. night activated my iPhone. <laughs> uh, I'm walking around with a Blackberry and I look like an old man, not for the gray hair, but just from that as well. But, you know, seriously, a young man went to the George Washington Bridge, jumped. Mm -hmm. He put out a statement on Facebook. He mm -hmm. was tweeting. He was the victim of what is an unrelentless bullying and has to be looked on. But we have to now judge whether or not a person committed a crime, should he be, then be deported for this, mm -hmm. and ultimately, what are we going to educate ourselves and how are we as a court system, as they go through the forensics, as they go through the liturgy of what a normal court proceeding goes through, how are we going to prepare to protect people so that they will watch the conduct that they're involved with and they'll curb the enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. This is all new, new cutting edge. And maybe this man did not really intend on causing harm. But the bias itself is so important that we teach uh, children, we teach people in schools early and young. And the question here again is, where are the parents? What's going on here? Mm -hmm. The parents that would send children off with this computer equipment, do you have parental controls? If you don't have parental controls, have you armed them with enough warnings and will they heed your call in this society? Yeah. Not that certain electronic equipment shouldn't be in the hands of kids, but everybody right now has access to everything and can cause harm to others without even purposefully intending it. And there are yeah. consequences. There are consequences to, to that behavior. Yeah, and there are significant consequences. And I think when you talk, you make a great point there. Where are the parents? But it becomes even more complicated. They're sending their child away to school. And I've heard so many people talk about Dar and Ravi maybe as being this guy who wanted to make a name for himself. And it's almost like that attitude of like, oh, look what I saw. You guys have to see this too. That, that attitude of wanting to be that guy. And I wonder if the parents right. in all this can explain to their kids some of the ramifications of a situation like this. And I say it all the time, not just in terms of their children getting in trouble, but the impact it could have on somebody else like it may have had on Tyler. Thank you so much, you guys. Hold on for just a second, folks. We're going to take a quick break. Again, we're in two trials, North Carolina versus Young and New Jersey versus Robbie. Young